Wow, this is a huge turnout. We're very thankful for everyone that's here. You know we're celebrating All Saints Sunday today. So we have a lot of special parts of the service where we're acknowledging the people who have passed near in time and long ago. There's going to be a special part of the service that will walk you through it. But as you can see, Elliot lit the Christ candle on a memorial table. So during the remembrance time, while we're singing our song, I'd invite you to come up. And as a matter of fact, you can do it any time in the service you think you want to. If you think of someone that's passed away, you'll just come up and grab one of the sticks and light one of the candles in memory. And we'll have a special part of the service for that later. If you would all please rise and join in singing our opening hymn, which we will begin by praising God. God and giving thanks for our salvation together. Eternal God, we remember saints and martyrs in every generation trusted in you. When we face persecution and loss, let us remember your love for us lasts forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Eternal God, you created Jesus' church to be the only institution that never ends. Protect her as you have through the many years 
especially during this pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, you grace us with leaders to govern us as instruments of your justice. Let us pay taxes and honor due those who serve, and guide us now as we vote. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, you made us your children. Heal our sick, calm our troubled, find our lost, comfort our grieving, and help our hurting. We remember especially today Ed, Stephanie, and Chad. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, show your kindness to the poor and use us as channels of your love. Remind us to be generous with the gifts you give us to support your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Eternal God, your son set his table among us in the presence of our enemies, giving us a foretaste of the eternal feast to come. Deliver us from any divisions that prevent our communion and bring us to that day when every tear shall be wiped from our eyes and we hunger and thirst no more, fully reunited to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Eternal God, into your merciful hands, we trust all for whom we pray. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and as you teach us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the third chapter of Micah. This is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel who despise justice and distort all that is right. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, and the temple hill a mound of overgrown thickets. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from the seventh chapter of Revelation. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. For every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders, the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worship God saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to God forever and ever, amen. When one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. 
And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here ends the second reading. The responsive reading today is from Psalm 43. Vindicate me, my God. Plead Plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from the deceitful. For you you are are God, God, my my stronghold. stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why Why must I I go about mourning? Send me your light and faithful care. Let Let them them lead lead me me to to where you dwell. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Put Put your your hope hope in in God. God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus taught, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and blessed are you. When people insult you, persecute you, and say falsely all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Can we turn the sound down a little bit? I had breakfast this morning, and so I'm going to be... talking loud, I'm sure, and it's already, I can hear it ringing in my ear a little bit. Today is All Saints Day. I mean, what a beautiful image, that picture of thousands upon thousands of us wearing white robes. When we were putting together this idea of the candle memorial, I, of course, ran it by our leaders in that area, and the altar guild has always been one of my most important parts of the church. When I was in seminary, all these young people were learning things about how communion was supposed to be done, and how church was supposed to be run. And they looked at me and they said, what are you going to do when you get in your first church? Because they were listing all the things they were going to do. I said, well, I am going to do anything that the ladies in the altar guild tell me to do. (laughs) And when I ran it by the altar guild, they said, well, that sounds a little Catholic. So my original plan was to wear the white robe, right? And I thought, well, maybe that's a little too Catholic. But you know, they don't wear the white robes because it makes us special. There's two reasons. Theologically, we wear it because it shows, and we're going to talk about this, Christ, his purity, his righteousness covering us, right? It's not us that God looks at. It's Christ that we're covered with. So that's one symbolic. The other thing is, you know, they didn't shower a lot back in the day, and so the priest, like everybody, was a little stinky, so, you know, it helped to have a little a a robe or an alb covering over. Enough of that. So... You are all saints, and all the people we love, my mama, my papa, who I'm about to light a candle for, and all the others, my best friend Randy, my grandmother, all these people who have gone before us, they are in heaven with God, doing who knows what, but one thing that we found out today is they're celebrating, they're happy. 
It may sound odd to say that all these people were saints. It may sound odd to say that you are a saint. Because we know that we're not perfect. But we are holy. To be a saint does not mean perfect. Unless the saints beat the bears today, and that would be perfect, yeah? The saint, the word saint means to be set apart for God's special purpose. Now, in God's eyes, like any father, any parent, you are perfect. He is draped over, he is covered over, he has atoned over all of your faults, sins, and failings by Jesus' blood and his righteousness. When he sees you, the first thing he sees is that perfection of Christ and your personal potential. Because Jesus not only paid all of the sins for all of us saints, he also broke us out of the jail that sin had over our lives. And now you have a power, which we learned last week, a superpower that you didn't have before. All of us know we have sin. All of us know we continue to sin. We get frustrated. We do stupid things. But now we have the power of the Holy Spirit not just our willpower, to say no to that sin in our life. Romans says it this way, the life-giving spirit gives us a power that is now yours through Jesus. He is the one who has freed us from sin and from death. Now, obviously, we don't look like eternal perfect people. Especially, I got a haircut. And I, I, the key to a haircut, apparently, is you have to comb your hair after they cut it. So I forgot that. Forgive that. But it reminded me of a joke about how we try to do something and fail. There was a dad who said to his son, you want to hear a really good Batman impersonation? Son said, sure, go ahead. And dad growled, no, not kryptonite. And the son said, dad, that's Superman. And dad said, thanks, I think it's pretty super too. It's for all the dad jokes. Today, November 1st, it rarely falls on a Sunday, which is a shame. We remember all those loved ones who aren't perfect, but they are saints. They're saints to us. Why were they saints to us? Nobody else remembers them. Nobody knows my mama. Nobody knows little Irene Wimberly, right? The worst singer in the history of all churches. And also the loudest singer in the history of all churches. And nobody remembers. Why are these people special to us? Because they invested in us. They invested their lives in our lives. They were good, what we call in church, stewards of their time on earth. They made friends. They made family. They made an impression. They made a legacy that lasts long after they pass. And the heart of our friendships and our kinships is not blood. It's that love that we have when we love others like we love ourselves. Caring about them. Overlooking occasionally their faults and sharing what we each have. That is stewardship. 1 Samuel says this way, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. Now that love, you know, is not an emotion, only an emotion. It's also an action. And often that action, what's the most common action of love that we have? Giving, right? giving someone food, giving them a present, give them a call. All these things are actions of love. We can give without love. You can do that, right? You can give somebody money or your time without love. But you cannot love without giving. Sharing ourselves, our time and our treasures, our money and our possessions. And so throughout this month of November, you're about to receive in a mail this beautiful little card we send out every year that says, hey, what would you like to give? Fill it out if you want to. Don't fill it out if you want to. But we're going to focus this month a little bit on our stewardship of the people and the gifts that God gives us. Jonathan gave his friend real things. He gave him his robe. He gave him his weapons. He also gave him his loyal support whenever his father, the king, accused David of doing something wrong. And ultimately what Jonathan gave his friend, whom he loved like himself, was he gave him his place in the palace and let David be next in line for the throne. He gave up control. Jonathan was a good steward because he worked to produce the best results for the kingdom. Getting his friend David to be the king next was the best thing he could have done, not just for that kingdom, but for our lives as well. In medieval times, which I, you know, if you know me at all, you know me, I love castles, right? I love castles. My favorite place 
One of the favorite places in America is St. Augustine. It's the oldest castillo, the oldest fort. I just love anything where stone is built strong as a protection. And in medieval times, the kings didn't just hang around their kingdom, right? They went to travel. They went to see great places. They went to see other kings and have parties constantly. Well, who ran the shop while they were gone? The stewards. And the stewards' job was to make sure that the king's estate made them money so they could travel around the world and have all these great king parties. They made sure that the tenants were productive and paying. But too often in church, when I mention stewardship, you do two things, right? You first grab your wallet, right? And then you, like, put your other hand on your pocket for your calendar. You're like, you're not going to get me to join another committee or something like that. Because we often think of stewardship as just donating time or our talents or our treasures. We're asking you to help decide what to do, and we're trying not to spend too much. There's an old joke that a landlord called the tenant, and he said, I need to come by your place and talk to you about this heating bill. It's out of control. And the tenant said, sure, that's fine. My door's always open. We may be good at pinching pennies in church, but I don't think we're good at expecting profits. We never ask, what is the income or the outcome of what we are producing? But that is stewardship. First and foremost, stewardship is about speaking faith over a situation, quoting God's words over our work and saying, God is going to get this done. Now, we do that in our personal lives. You speak favor over your children. You say, oh, you're a beautiful person. You have such great potential. You're able to do all that. We speak those words of faith over them all the time. A farmer speaks words of faith over dirt and says, I'm going to invest thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, and bury it in the ground, and it's going to produce a huge harvest, a crop. That is what we're focusing on. Calling God's calling the saints to be stewards, set apart to do something great with the great things God has given us. And in church, we're going to talk about five things often, time, Talent, treasures, testimonies, and touches. God asks you, though, to decide in your own heart what you give and what you do. And then do it cheerfully. Nobody likes anybody grumpy. I would rather have a dollar and a smile than a hundred dollars from someone complaining the whole way, right? It's what my grandmother told me, Mama. She said, uh, be careful marrying a rich person because you'll spend your whole life earning it. Okay, I thought it was good, but she, she's lying. For my money and my time, I like to give 10% because that's all over the Bible. It's not a requirement per se, but it's something to think about. For me, I give 10% of my time. So in theory, right, that's 10 hours a week because I'm basically awake and pretty much free 100 hours a week if you take out my sleep time and things like that. I give 10% of my money immediately. I know the Bible says not to share that, but if you can't share it in public as the pastor, you know, I don't know. Just like taxes, 10% of everything that comes in, more or less, goes into a special fund. And then I use that for various purposes. You may have 1%. You may do half a percent. I think the average is 2.5%. doesn't matter, as long as you do it out of your heart. I try to share also the talents that God has given me, the testimonies. He's bringing me through a lot of trials, and it's worked out okay. And also, I've had a lot of touches. I've had a lot of people loving on me. A lot of people loving on me. And so I try my best to share that love, because you never know. You never know what someone's going through. And what I learned this week is you never know what someone is about to go through. And so it's good to share those gifts in advance. I've also done some non-spiritual things that are dedicated to God. The reason I don't usually speak in the first person like this, you know, you notice that after six months, but we're asking a few people to come up here over these, we've, almost every Sunday we've had a guest come up and speak or a member come up and speak. Next week, I believe, uh, we have Tom is going to come up and speak when Pastor Herb is here. So I've done non-spiritual things, but I've dedicated them to God. It doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be a lot. There was a widow. A woman had no income. Jesus saw her come to the temple, and she put a mite in the treasury box. A mite is half of the smallest coin that existed at that time. It was worth about six minutes of the regular working person's wages. Six minutes. And when she put that in, Jesus said she had given more than the wealthiest people who come in and put in bags of gold. Being a steward just means using whatever God has blessed you with as a saint in his kingdom. And stewardship like love is not about saving it for later. It's about producing more of it. How many of you remember the loved ones that have gone before you 
because they never showed you how much they loved. They saved their love for that last big moment. They wanted to go out with a bang. No, no. Jesus said the ones rewarded are the ones who double what they've got. And then some of us who bury our gifts, trying not to lose anything, were cast out into the darkness. That's why we love those who produce memories in us and help us to be better people. I cannot imagine what I would be like if it had not been for what Mama and Papa and Grandma and Randy and all those other people invested in me. Loving someone, though, is a risk. If you love, you might what? You might get hurt. You might lose. But it is far better to love and to have lost than to have never loved at all. One other thing that we give, besides our treasures and our, I call it attention, our love, is our time. It seems to me that the world is governed by time. We are surrounded by clocks, calendars, and now phones. I have had so many friends now that wear these watches that beep constantly. I'm like, what are we supposed to do? They dictate our lives, but as the minutes tick by, we still wonder how time flies. Even though we, we try to steward that money, we try to hold on and save every moment, it still just disappears and we wonder where the days went. Humans are often and have always been slaves of time. Just like we are often slaves of sin and slaves of money and we're slaves because we feel limited by our talents. But here's the, the good news. God does not call people that have what he needs because God doesn't need anything. There's an old saying in the pastor process, that God doesn't call the equip, he equips the call, right? you got nothing that God don't, doesn't have. He's not interested in your giving per se, he's interested again in your willingness to open up your heart and to risk giving yourself away. Twice in the Bible, God actually made more time, if you can believe it. He stopped the sun, he turned back time. The only other person in history who has done that is, of course... Chair. I didn't even write that in my notes. That came from my heart. You're welcome. <laughs> the pagans even worshipped time. They said that Kronos, the titan Kronos, was the father of all the gods. And today we even refer to father time. But our heavenly father doesn't work that way. Have you noticed that when he sent his son, he let him wait like 30 years. And then only used him for a year and a half, two years, maybe three years, depending on how we read the scripture. And yet Jesus in that small time period did more in his life than any other human that has ever walked on this planet. God doesn't need everything. He just needs something. Many of you have worked your whole life to raise a family to earn a retirement. And now God is looking at you, and I'm trying not to look at the people in the congregation who are about to retire, but you know I've already reached out to you. And he's saying, you know what? I've waited 60 years. Are you ready to do something just for me? Just a little something just for me. And that's a thought. I also think, has it ever seemed to you that you turn on, you know, uh, Billy Joel wrote that song, Only the Good Die Young? Doesn't there seem to be some truth to that? You see these... I see these stories, I don't know, the musicians, scientists, people, I'm not up on them. And they pass away early, right? And I think, wow, they accomplished so much at 20, 24, 30, something like that. Sometimes, I don't know why, but it seems like certain people on this planet can live an incredibly full life. There's a guy named uh, Rich Mullins, who's a Christian singer. Have you ever heard of Rich Mullins? Oh, my God, I still listen to his music. He died near the place where I just moved from. I crossed over that spot almost every day going to teach at the college. He died there at such a young age. And yet he did so much. Why? Because he gave his time to God and God can do a whole lot with a little. Sorry, I get really parched up here. So obviously you know you can't serve two masters. You can't serve time and money and God and money. You've got you to pick one thing. You have to spend your time with God. And maybe later through this month we'll talk about the ways we invest as stewards. We invest in mutual funds, treasury funds, bonds, growth funds, and global funds. I've got some clever things I could share about that, but there's a lot of them. 
But the thing I really want to talk about as good saints, as good stewards of what God has given you, the first step in investing is beginning to think like an investor. Begin to think about long-term gains instead of the short-term pain, right? Start to think about the long-term gains from what you're doing as a Christian instead of the short-term, yeah, I don't want to spend a 10 minutes, an hour, whatever, with God this morning. I want to go do something else. I'm late for work. Well, he's asking you to sacrifice. Why? Because there's a long-term investment. He wants you to think that way. Romans 8, 5 says, those dominated by their sinful nature, and we all have a sinful nature, are inclined to think about sinful things. But those led by the Holy Spirit begin to think about things that please the Spirit. So let's briefly talk as we close, a couple minutes. Let's talk about, and I put this in the sermon title, taking the, the, uh, taking the sin out of your life. Does anybody here have sin? In their, don't raise your hand, because we have guests. They need to think we're perfect. We don't want to spoil that. Jesus' little brother said, wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and all kinds of evil. So real quick, an eye-centered life is the heart of all sin. You notice the word sin, S-I-N. What does it have in the middle? I. You notice in that beautiful reading that Penny read today, she said there are even ministers of God. Now, I've never met them, but there are ministers of God who are a mess, Right? They said, they're only happy if you're feeding them. Now I'm thinking about all the times I asked for donuts and coffee. <laughs> and they will wage war on you if you don't give them what they want. What is that? That's an I-centered life. That's a me What's in it for me, right? What's in it for me? I don't have time. I don't have money. I don't have the talent. I'm afraid. I'm upset. I'm offended. I can't spend all my day helping someone else. I'm busy. Especially can't help someone that I don't know or that I don't think deserve it. Notice the letter I is in the middle of all of these words. Crime, lying, defiant, guilty, fatigue, pessimism, hostility, emptiness, and envious. Even the word merciless has a double whammy, C-I. And then my favorite one, criticizing. In the middle it says I-C-I. When you're criticizing, you're like, I see, I. it's all about what I want. The antidote, therefore, to sin is letting God into the center of our lives. Don't remove the eye. He made you. He loves you. He cares about who you are. Just move over a little bit to make room for something else, like tithe, giving, praising, and really living. The antidote to sin is a Greek word called apodote, which means to pay or to give away. And during this great election week, we will end on this one reminder from Romans 13, 7 through 14. I urge you to pay, to apodote, all that you owe. Tribute to tribute, taxes to taxes. For those economists in the room, there are two kinds of taxes back then. A tribute was where a person gave per head, like one day's wages. And then you paid a property tax on your house. So one for one. And then the other, the revenue tax was you gave 10% of your crop, which was included in your rent as a tenant, or you paid a toll when you came into town to sell your stuff, like 2 to 5%. So those are two kinds of taxes. So tribute to tribute, taxes to taxes, and if you owe respect, then pay respect. If honor, honor, and let no debt remain except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves completely Fulfills, fulfills the law and the prophets. Amen, saints. Would you please, I think I'm asking you to rise at this point, but why don't you just stay seated because I can't remember. We're going to say one of my favorite prayers. It's a saint prayer, right? Saint Francis of Assisi. But it's a saint you and me prayer too. God, make me like this. Help me to be the investment vehicle in other people's lives. Help me to be a good steward. To give what you've given me. So would you, you, would you please join me in saying the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. 
Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Oh, praise God. I would urge you to take this bulletin home as I do every week and say that prayer every single day. Maybe every single day this month. As we rise to sing, let's, say, let's continue to stay seated. Does anybody need to stretch their legs? Is everybody okay? okay let's just stay seated for a little bit. We're going to sing a beautiful song called There's Something About That Name. And while we're singing it, I thought I would demonstrate. Even in non-COVID times, I've never had a, a crowd that sort of drifts. Just come by, one by one on this side, and get a little lighter. And just light it on the Christ candle. And just remembering someone that you love, light a candle for them, so that they're all burning We'll do a lot better job than mine. Maybe you have to pick it up. Beautiful. I do love my grandparents. I miss them so much. All right, and then we have a nice little basket of sand right here. So while we're singing, I just invite you one by one or in small groups to come on up and light a candle for a family or a friend.
scripture tells us that in heaven, scripture tells us that in heaven, plenty of things are going to be going on. There's going to be angels of all different sizes and stripes and missions going and coming. There's going to be people from all different countries, all different families, all different skin cultures, skin colors from all different ages. And a lot of the Christians that I know firmly believe that we will have many jobs to do and many fun things to do in heaven. That everything we have here is just a, a blueprint, a picture, a seed of what's to come. And in the future, when we have all of the time in the world, that little seed of our life and how we spend our time and the things we do is going to grow into a massive and beautiful, fruitful tree. When my son was very little, my mom came to visit. And she said, David, you are in seminary to be a pastor. I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, your kids don't know anything about heaven. And I said, well, I guess it just never come up. So taking my cue from my mom, we sat down at dinner and I said to the kids, what do you like to do? And my son said, I really like mixed media art. You know what mixed media art is? Does anybody know? I have no idea either. So I asked him. It's amazing when you know, a first or second grade kid can know more than you do. And I said, what's that? He says, well, if you use all different kinds of media, any, like clay and paint and paper, and you make all kinds of art out of all of it. I said, oh, well, are you good at that? And he said, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Um, he did get a B, though, on one assignment. And we had a parent-teacher conference and everything. What was the B for? Because apparently he had sneezed during the application of his splatter paint, and it went all over. And so his teacher said he didn't follow directions. He said he just sneezed. And it blew. So I said, if you had all the time in the world to do mixed-media art, how much better could you get? He said, oh, man, I could make some really cool things. I could make big things. Maybe I could even figure out how to do it digitally on a computer. And he was big at that time in Minecraft. Does anybody know what Minecraft is? So he had like the little Minecraft box outfits and the little sword and the shield and things like that. And I could build an incredible world. And I said, now imagine if you had hundreds and hundreds of years to learn and do everything. And he got to the point, this little kid at the table, he said, you know, I, I could build a whole planet. And we read a lot of science fiction to the kids when they were little. He said, I could terraform the planet. That means taking a dead planet and making it full of life and create all kinds of animals. So we're going to have all kinds of eternity to do all kinds of amazing things. But one thing that we are all going to come back together and often do is what Penny read to us. We're going to come before the throne of God and we're just going to praise and worship God together. Glory and honor and majesty and thanksgiving and power and might be yours, Lord God, forever and ever. And the best among us are going to bow down and throw their crowns and the greatest and most powerful the angels I've always imagined wouldn't be in a circle, but they would be flying all around in a giant sphere. And we're going to spend time doing exactly what we're doing here today. Today, Lord God, we remember your goodness to us and the wonderful family and friends that you gave us. And we give you thanks for those who have fought the good fight, who have finished the race, who kept the faith, and who now live with you, and of course, in our memories, in our heart. The brother-in-law of Daphne, John Bates. The cousin of Sue, Billy. Kathy's mother, Adeline Brunton, Laura's friend, Elise Fry, the Demo family friend, Dennis Ego. I go. I go. Rick's aunt, Dorothy Klesweski, Kathy's niece, Melissa Laufenberg, Cindy's Aunt Miriam LeBaron, Bob and Karen's daughter in law, 
Peggy Lowry. Carol's son-in-law, Ron Meyer. Rick and Mary Jo's friend, Andrew Murray. A dear, long-term friend of Pam and the godfather of Chad, Fred Peterson, Jr. Dan's sister, Kathy Pierce. Rick's aunt, Franny Smith. Cindy's father, Maurice Terhark. Laura's friend, Carol Waters. Penny's lifelong friend, Jean Williams. Mary's cousin, Thomas Stevenson. If there are any that we did not name who passed away this year, Jean's sister, Maura. What's your mother in law's name? Linda's mother in law, Marie. I do remember that. Tom's dear friend, Vera Lewis. On my day off Friday, I had the distinct privilege to go and be with the family and friends of a young man who passed away at 34, had just had his first baby. And you would think it's a feeling of loss and tragedy, and it is. But there's something special about taking time to pause and say, I love you, to say, I remember you, and to say, I can't wait to see you again. The Lord be with you. Eternal God, we remember the unseen cloud of witnesses who encompass about us, those who in every age and every generation, who witness to their faith in you, in life and now in death, those who by their courage and their self-sacrifice won for us the freedom and the liberty we enjoy, those who serve their fellow women and men, those who have loved and have gone now to be loved by you. We remember the names that are written on our hearts and the names that are written in the book of your Lamb. Help us to walk worthy of these saints in whose unpresence, unseen presence we now live. Help us to have in our lives their perseverance in difficulty, their loyalty in challenges, their love, Help us to show the joy, all the good we learn from them. In Jesus' name, amen. It was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it for his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, after talking with his friends and explaining once again that he was about to die and explaining once again that they were going to abandon him and listening once again to them saying, No, Lord, that will never happen. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant 
in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Just like the memories of those that we've lost for a time stay with us, influence us, or are part of us, and never go away, Jesus is so much more alive in you. And I ask that you receive his blessing, that the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you and strengthen you in his grace. Amen. Now, according to my clock. We're not slaves to time, of course, but we are either 10 minutes ahead of schedule or we are 50 minutes late. So either way, we've got plenty of time. We won't need it. But invite you. We, we did cut out offering, didn't we? And we did that intentionally. Why don't you go ahead and bring the offering up since you're bouncing like bunny rabbits back there and happy. I was afraid we wouldn't have any time. You know me, I like to cut things out of the service as much as possible. This is a great way to end our service and to begin our month of focus on stewardship as we bring a small bit of the wonderful gifts God has given us. This beautiful state and community in which we live, this beautiful country. Everybody's so excited about the election. Every one of us is excited. Some about the election and some that it will soon be over. And so we, I would urge you to give God, to give your neighbors a little bit of your time and go vote if you haven't already. God is going to take these gifts that you give and he's going to do wonderful things. This whole church, this beautiful facility started because a few people, regular people, just like us. Somebody cooked some food, somebody came to do a little work, someone donated some talent and expertise and some, a lot of us gave a little bit of money. The Bible says don't despise the small beginnings. So we celebrate these gifts and we thank God knowing he will multiply them. But more than that, he will multiply us. He said that you are the light of the world. So as we close, we will go out singing shine, Jesus shine. And I would urge you to be that light, be that saint, be the one that someone remembers when you're gone as being that special person who showed them what God can do. Amen. Jesus shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, all the nations with love and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let them. of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine jesus shine Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, Spirit, place, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, all the nations.
today. We'd like to remind you that the Christmas boxes are due in two weeks. If you haven't got with Pam or Cara from that back table, make sure you get yours and make sure you invite a friend to do that with you. What a great bridge opportunity for them to connect. This Wednesday night, we're going to try to light the bonfire that I built. I will not guarantee that it won't collapse and flood the nation with flames, but Apparently, I've missed the whole bonfire pit idea, and I built a bonfire hill, so it's pretty tall. We'll see how that goes. Six o'clock, you can bring marshmallows and things. I'm sure there'll be enough uh, snacks. The uh, council's still looking for someone or some group that would like to lead our service projects for the next year. And after coffee and donuts today, most of the tables have been removed for the election in the room, but we still have a few more. If you want to help tidy those up and put those against the wall, that would be great. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord is going to make his face shine on you as his favorite child. The Lord is going to look upon you with favor. And wherever you go, he is going to give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today, either in person or online. If you would like to participate online and you don't have any of our communion cups, feel free to call the office. In fact, you can call the office for anything. It's 815-624-2115. That's 815-624-2115. We also have a lot of great resources on our new website and on Facebook. Facebook, our handle, you can type in Prince of Peace, but the handle is at... Pop Rock Lutheran. So at Pop Rock Lutheran. And our website is www.poprockton.com. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.